It's the world's most extreme aircraft carrier. Standing ready with the finest planes, the most powerful weapons, and the best pilots the Navy has to offer. It's a pretty difficult job, but it's probably one of the most rewarding. It's the greatest job out here. Each mission demands perfection. On board this mobile war machine, there's no margin for error. You just revert to your training and don't think about it. If you think about it, you're going to be dead. Come along for an exclusive look at the aircraft, weapons, and sailors aboard the U.S. Navy's most sophisticated supercarrier, the USS Ronald Reagan. The USS Ronald Reagan. It's the world's largest mobile combat airport. With thousands of highly trained crew members supporting the ship's high-powered air operations. Our all-access pass now takes us into the cockpit, onto the flight deck, and up into the air with the Navy's amazing aircraft. The Reagan's a floating piece of American territory. It can deliver a military presence almost anywhere in the world. But it's more than a ship. It also brings along more than 60 aircraft. Together, they're the ship's air wing, worth more than $2 billion. Each of the six different types of planes performs a unique mission. We're launching aircraft, catapults two, three, and four. Stand well clear. Shoot them up. The F-18 Hornet is the heart of the air wing. It's the Navy's top strike fighter aircraft, thanks to its reliability and performance during combat. The F-18 is a versatile aircraft. It can easily switch between attacking targets on the ground and targets in the air. If you're going in to uh, attack a target and you have to defend yourself against enemy aircraft uh, on the way in and on the way out from that target, the Hornet can do that. And it's an extremely pilot-friendly aircraft to fly. The Reagan has two F-18 models, the $29 million Hornet and the latest version, the $54 million Super Hornet. Measuring 60 feet 4 inches long with a wingspan of 44 feet 11 inches, the Super Hornet has a top speed surpassing Mach 1.8, more than 1,300 miles per hour. With that kind of speed at their disposal, these planes can create a sonic boom as they easily fly past the sound barrier. F-18s are equipped with the latest in instrument technology, and one of the most important is the cockpit-mounted heads-up display, or HUD. It's a visual information readout projected onto a mounted unit sitting right in the pilot's field of view. Hold on, hold on. Roger ball, Super the HUD shows essential data like airspeed, altitude, and flight path. We can virtually fly with nothing but the information we have in our HUD. The HUD is an excellent uh, aid for uh, landing on the uh, aircraft carrier because we have that uh, instantaneous flight information available to us as we look outside. The Reagan's air wing includes four other planes. One is the $52 million EA-6B Prowler, an advanced radar jamming jet. It's 59 feet, 10 inches long, with a wingspan of 53 feet and a top speed of 500 knots, nearly 600 miles per hour. The Reagan carries one squadron of four prowlers and 24 air crew. Their job is to protect the Reagan and its planes from enemy radar-guided missiles. the Prowler first detects enemy radar signals in its tail fin. The crew then uses an onboard computer, the tactical jamming system, 
to send out energy that confuses enemy radar, hiding the Navy's airplanes and ships. If you think of an enemy radar as a uh, fire or a wildfire that needs to be uh, suppressed, we're out there on the scene with our jammers to uh, suppress it, the enemy radar and save lives. That's the main mission of the Prowler, is saving other lives, making sure all of our friends come back safely back on board the ship. When it comes to the Navy's own in-air surveillance of the skies, no plane is better than the E-2C Hawkeye. It's 57 and a half feet long, with a wingspan of 80 feet 7 inches, and a top speed of more than 300 knots, nearly 350 miles per hour. The Reagan carries one squadron of four Hawkeyes and 25 air crew. I'd like to cover track one, two, three, four with birds if possible. The $80 million Hawkeye is the strike group's intelligence in the air, providing early warning of any potential enemy threat. Flying above 19,000 feet of altitude, the Hawkeye has a sensitive radar inside its rotating 24-foot dome it can see 250 miles in any direction, covering an airspace of 6 million cubic miles. The plane's powerful computerized sensors can locate and track more than 2,000 targets. So the E-2 is looking hundreds of miles out ahead of us, clearing the path, letting us know if there's any airborne adversaries out there. They do that for the ship as well back here. They can provide early warning for the uh, ship and the entire strike group. Inside the Hawkeye, the three-person surveillance crew processes threat identification picked up from the radars and relays it to the F-18s and the strike group ships. We're really the ones that are able to, to help out when people need it. You know, we may not be the ones that are out there, you know, dropping bombs or shooting missiles, but if somebody's in trouble, they know that they can always reach us. All right, Katie, as soon as they get the BID, you let me know, and I'll pass it. Okay. The Reagan's air wing also includes the trusty SH-60 Seahawk. It's 64 feet, 10 inches long, with a rotor diameter of 53 feet, 8 inches, and a top speed of 180 knots, more than 200 miles per hour. During flight operations, the carrier always has at least one of its six Seahawks in the air in case of emergency. These helicopters, worth more than $20 million each, are always the first to launch off the flight deck and the last to return. The squadron's 20 pilots are ready for a search and rescue operation anytime. They've got trained rescue swimmers that can jump out of that helicopter get a pilot or an air crew out of the water, get them hooked up, and get them hoisted back up into the helicopter. Rounding out the air wing is the Navy's flying workhorse, the C-2 Greyhound. This delivery plane is 57 feet and 7 inches long, with a wingspan of 80 feet 7 inches. It has a top speed of 300 knots, just under 350 miles per hour. The Reagan has a two-plane detachment of the $39 million Greyhounds, known to the crew as COD, or Carrier Onboard Delivery. These Air Wing Elder Statesmen carry passengers and supplies wherever they're needed. Well, the Carrier Onboard Delivery, so I like to see those guys quite a bit. That's actually my favorite airplane because it brings me uh, all the things that I need to help the crew. The Reagan's Air Wing, the Hornet, the Super Hornet, the Prowler, the Hawkeye, the Seahawk, and the Greyhound. They're a sizable collection of more than 60 planes, ready to take on any mission the Navy requests. The Air Wing's planes are heavy users of jet fuel specifically JP-5, a fuel that's unlikely to ignite at high temperatures. 
During heavy air operations, the air wing of the USS Ronald Reagan uses more than 200,000 gallons of fuel a day. Yet the supercarrier's onboard tanks can hold three and a half million gallons. So its supply can last for weeks at a time. To keep these multi-million dollar machines from breaking down, the flight deck crew must be vigilant. Even a single small item left unattended can wreak havoc. Everybody watch, sail hooks, watch all leading edges, and stab, let's go! More than five times a day, everyone takes a break from flight ops for a walk. But this is no ordinary walk. It's an intensive search along the entire flight deck for any foreign object debris, or FOD. Despite safety measures like the FOD walk, unexpected events occur and operations shut down until the flight deck is cleared to continue. The crew of the Aircraft Intermediate Maintenance Department keeps the air wing and its multi-million dollar engines in top condition. These F-18 engines are reliable and high performance. They rarely need more than a check after each flight. Still, when FOD damage occurs, that's when the department's jet shop crew goes to work. Well, basically, the, the jet shop is just like if you take your car to Jiffy Lube and you put it on a diagnostics and they tell you what's wrong with your car. We do the same thing here. Tonight, the crew has just fixed a vibration issue on this F-18 engine, and now they're checking it with the computerized test cell. After measuring for proper fuel pressure, airflow, and engine speed, they've got one last step, and it can only happen in the middle of the night when no planes are flying. Being that what we replace requires us to check certain things, so we got to do a full run tonight. A full run means testing engine performance through its entire operating range, from idle up to full afterburner. But the jet shop crew can't test an engine when it's on a plane, so they have to strap it on the stern of the ship and fire it up. The afterburner roars while the jet shop crew watches. Finally, the test is over. The engine is fixed. By morning, the jet shop crew will be on to another repair job, and air operations on the USS Ronald Reagan will continue. The USS Ronald Reagan's air wing, known as Carrier Air Wing 14. It provides the American military with mobile firepower and surveillance. Now, let's go behind the scenes to take a closer look at the pilots who fly these planes. Out here, airborne operations take center stage, and the F-18 aviators are the stars of the show. Every flight we do here, we know we're going to do something exciting because we take off and land on the carrier. On board the carrier, the air wing includes seven squadrons of more than 60 planes and nearly 2,000 sailors. Most crew are in support roles. Only 100 are pilots, separated into tightly knit squadrons of 10 to 15. Typical pilot in the air wing who flies uh, these F-18s, for example, it's going to be a lieutenant, mid to late 20s maybe, maybe 30 years old at the most. They've earned the right to fly jets off this aircraft, spending a couple, uh, couple of years in flight school to get their wings. And then we demand a lot of them when we're out here. On the Reagan's current three-month deployment in the Pacific Ocean, every one of the 60 F-18 pilots flies a daylight or nighttime mission nearly every day. A single training mission lasts about an hour, but a real combat mission can last an exhausting eight hours. Hopefully we'll stop flying at night here in a few days, which will be a relief for us all, but uh, it's a pretty long day, it really is. A naval aviator's typical day starts with flight planning and a mission brief in the ready room. 
final rendezvous will be in the combat spread, and I'll talk about Today, that. Lieutenant George uh, De Janeiro, call sign Waldo, is briefing his flying partner, Commander Jeffrey Winter, call sign Chile, on their upcoming training mission. During these briefings, pilots rely heavily on military acronyms. Primary mission is to go out and execute 1v1 one, one one high aspect BFM, alternate mission possibly DCA. A 1v1 high aspect BFM is a one-on-one -on -one basic fighter maneuver or in-air dogfight between two F-18 Hornets. This briefing also prepares both pilots for the mission, its location and airspace boundaries, and the weapon and fuel requirements. Very similar to uh, when a coach comes up with a game plan for, for a football team uh, right before a game. He says, hey, this is what we want to do. You know, granted, there's a million different possibilities as to what might actually happen, but this is our going in game plan. This is how we're going to uh, attack this adversary. After the brief, Lieutenant De Janeiro and Commander Winter head to a nearby Paraloft their dressing room to suit up for flight. One critical piece of gear, the G-suit. During dynamic flight maneuvers, it slows the drain of blood from the brain and extremities, thus preventing a blackout. This is the anti-G-suit worn by our pilots. That's the first piece of gear they put on. The second piece of gear they put on is the torso harness. And after that, they'll put on their survival vest just like a regular vest, zips up in the front. An oxygen mask so they can breathe. The gear weighs about 25, 30 pounds that they wear every day. Together, their flight gear, including G-suit, survival vest, oxygen mask, and helmet, is worth more than $6,000. Up on the flight deck, Lieutenant De Janeiro follows a strict set of launch procedures. The brown shirt plane captain turns the F-18 over to him, and he checks that all tools from the plane's pre-flight maintenance review are accounted for. A final walk around, then he climbs into the cockpit. Pryfly gives the go-ahead, and the plane's ready to launch. When the pilot and the plane are prepped and ready, they taxi into position. Hand signals from yellow and green shirt crew guides the plane's front wheel, its nose gear, up to the catapult. And a holdback bar holds the plane in place until launch. The pilot grabs a handle called the towel rack and hangs on tight for the launch. I think it's a lot like being at the, the apex of the hill on a roller coaster right before you go down. It's the best thrill ride you'll ever get in your life. All you're thinking about is, OK, is this catapult going to work today? Up in the air, the team of F-18 pilots completes their mission. Training missions, like dogfighting and bombing runs, are designed to simulate actual combat. And on this Pacific Ocean deployment, missions have very real-world implications. We just were with being near Korea and uh, North Korea. If we overfly some of those boundaries, you know, we'll hear about on CNN the next morning. The Super Hornet is a reliable fighter jet with a combat range of over 1,450 miles. But on longer missions, they'll often require a refuel from a specially configured tanker, usually another Super Hornet. During a mid-air refueling, the tanker extends a hose and basket, and the pilot below must carefully link in with a retractable fuel probe. It takes about 10 minutes for a refill, and pilots must hold their positions tightly. A torn hose could spray fuel onto his jet and impair his visibility. When the mission's complete, 
Lieutenant De Janeiro circles back to the carrier. A little, a little low start. The go-ahead from the landing signal officer tells him to bring the plane in for a landing. It's no simple feat. De Janeiro's maneuvers must be exact as he guides the speeding plane toward the flight deck. To stop, he must hook a wire on a runway about 800 feet long. It's an easy process for him now, but he still remembers his first carrier flight and landing. It's something I really couldn't even describe, but uh, it's a very interesting feeling. It's the coolest thing I will ever do in my life. Lieutenant De Janeiro taxis the plane into a parking spot and turns it back over to the plane captain. He and his partner then head back to the ready room to debrief the results of the last flight and begin planning the next. Left or right to there's, your, there's really no oblique uh, nature of my turn at all. Pretty much I, I check 025 and go straight up through the bullseye. Flying a daytime mission requires concentration and focus. But when the sun goes down, pilots face the most challenging aspect of naval aviation, night flight. It's something that a lot of people never really get used to. I don't think the Wright brothers would have invented an airplane if, uh, if they were, had flying at night in mind, especially off of an aircraft carrier. Uh, it's not something that's necessarily fun, but it will get your heart beating. Many combat missions are flown under cover of darkness so aviators must also train this way. Yet at night, no horizon is visible, and pilots can easily lose a sense of their surrounding space. On an exceptionally dark night, which we'll have when there's no moon or when there's weather above us blocking out the, uh, the moon and the stars, it can be very disorienting. One piece of gear that helps out, night vision goggles. These are the night vision goggles, a uh, nice, small, lightweight piece of gear so it doesn't uh, hurt too much or it doesn't strain your neck too much when you're flying with them uh, at night. Gives us the opportunity to see the horizon, see other airplanes, see things on the ground uh, out at range. These are not uh, binoculars in uh, any sense. All they're doing is amplifying the ambient light that, that is out there. During a landing, pilots shift their focus to the meatball, a moving amber light on the flight deck's instrument display. It moves up and down to indicate vertical angle of approach to the runway. Pilots count on the meatball to guide them safely in. Yet they often don't realize how close they are to the carrier. And the touchdown can be a jarring surprise. It can go south very quickly when you're landing on the carrier at night. You just revert to your training and don't think about it. If you think about it, you're going to be dead. If a pilot's glide slope is incorrect by even a small margin, he could strike the back of the carrier, as this F-18 did on the Reagan in January 2006. The pilot ejected safely, but the plane was lost in the ocean. Still, despite the ever-present danger, these naval aviators are well-trained, and they rely on their years of experience to fly and land safely. You gotta kind of stay relaxed and stay focused on what you're doing and not think too hard about what you're gonna do. For the men and women of the Reagan's air wing, it comes down to a passion for flying these high-tech toys. It's a pretty difficult job, but it's probably one of the most rewarding. It's awesome to fly on and off the boat. It's the greatest job out here. It's pretty sweet.
the Reagan has dozens of highly trained pilots flying the Navy's most versatile strike fighter, the F-18. These powerful planes require explosive weaponry to complete their missions. So the Reagan is packed to the gills with 10 million pounds of ordnance. The F-18 Super Hornet carries up to 11 pieces of ordnance on every flight, attached to hooks on the wings or body of the plane. Some weapons are guided by GPS, radar, or heat-seeking infrared, like the Sidewinder missile. Others are simply dumb bombs, heavy, unguided explosives weighing between 500 and 2,000 pounds. And then, there's the Hornet's powerful gun, a 20 millimeter cannon that shoots 6,000 rounds per minute. Every piece of the ship's ordnance is kept in one of 34 storage units called magazines. Flight preparation begins in a well-protected assembly room deep inside the carrier, five decks below the waterline. Here, Unarmed weapons are assembled for combat by a well-trained crew of ordnance handlers known as the G3 Division. They're trained as a cohesive unit, and through that training, that's how we become more proficient in handling weapons. The crew is preparing a 500-pound Mark 80 series unguided dumb bomb. On the bomb's back end, an aerodynamic fin is attached. It'll help the bomb fly more accurately to its target. At the same time, a nose plug is installed on the front end to give the bomb greater target penetration. The crew adds a safety switch and inspects the bomb. A pneumatic hoist moves it from the assembly table to a skid for transport to the flight deck. This well-trained crew is efficient completing the ordnance assembly in about a minute. One of the ship's nine ordnance elevators brings the bomb to a staging area, or bomb farm, located on the flight deck's starboard side. Inspect loads and fin for alignment, security. After one last inspection, the G3s hand custody of the bomb to the squadron's own ordnance crew they'll load the weapon onto an F-18. There's no room on the flight deck for pneumatic hoists, so this six-person team must lift the bomb by hand and carefully lock it into place on the F-18's wing. For leverage, they use metal poles, nicknamed hernia bars. Bring it up! Finally, the bomb is safely locked and tightened into place. At this stage, with the dumb bomb tightly attached to the plane, the crew can arm it for combat with an exploding fuse. Moving ordnance is a precision operation that's never rushed. A single misstep could lead to a crew member injury or an unplanned flight deck detonation. Disasters that are extremely rare yet catastrophic when they occur. July 29, 1967. The aircraft carrier USS Forrestal was deployed near Vietnam. Shortly before 11 in the morning, an uncontrolled electrical surge inadvertently launched a Zuni rocket from an F-4 Phantom jet. The weapon struck another jet. Within seconds, burning fuel and exploding bombs turned the flight deck into a fiery death trap. Sailors rushed to battle the blaze, only to encounter more explosions and a deadly inferno. It took nearly 14 hours to extinguish the blaze. 
more than 50 planes were damaged or destroyed, and 134 of the Forrestal's crew died or went missing. In the carrier's most dangerous situations, one team is on the front line. The EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. From defusing a damaged bomb to handling unexploded ammunition, EOD takes the greatest risks of anyone on the ship. Our motto is initial success or total failure, and that summarizes pretty much what we do. One task, diffusing underwater mines, requires a helocast, a Seahawk helicopter ride deep into the open ocean. Out here, miles from the carrier, the team runs an intense drill, jumping into the water, then climbing back into the low-flying helicopter. Obviously, there's some risk, but it's a, it's a challenge. It's fun to do to, to work with some of those guys, jump them out of the helo, and then uh, pick them up. Safety's not just for the EOD crew. Emergency preparedness is a task every sailor on this supercarrier takes very seriously step it up, step it up, and a routine part of life in the Navy. To prepare for emergencies, the crew of the USS Ronald Reagan constantly runs practice drills, sometimes daily. And because they're being watched and graded by their superiors, they're under pressure to perform perfectly. To Captain Terry Kraft, safety drills are a key part of life on the Reagan. Yeah, so a lot of stuff, you know, this ship can come under attack at any time. And that's why we are constantly drilling and preparing for anything that might happen. The more you drill people, the more they're confident and they absolutely know their roles, the better they're going to be, you know, in a time of crisis. At least once a week, the ship goes to general quarters, a readiness condition where the crew practices drills to ensure the ship's survival. Beat up the best game! A general quarters is called away uh, any time the ship encounters uh, missile attacks or torpedoes, uh, and that's basically used to set up uh, the highest state of readiness. While crew members simulate attack damage and fire with flags, another team sets out to assess the ship's damage and confronts and smothers the blaze. Several times a year, the Reagan's crew runs the mass casualty drill, a simulation where sailors are injured or dead. We got a tourniquet on you. We're controlling bleeding. We got morphine on board for your pain. You're going to be all right. Just hurt in your stomach. You hurt anywhere else? All right, we got open femur fracture, hypotensive. Lieutenant Margaret Brockman is one of the ship's medical officers. What we run is a drill as though a plane has crashed. Um, and today we have 50 casualties on the deck. All right, make sure you notate the car at what time the tourniquet was applied, what time the morphine was given. The medical crew goes to work on the casualties, removing them from the flight deck. It's a massive operation and one they must practice to prepare for an emergency. The stable object is secured, so he's a delay just came down. The Ronald Reagan's been lucky. We've never had need of an actual mass casualty. We shoot hundreds of planes a day, and um, it doesn't even need to be a combat operation. If one of those planes misses, um, that's a mass casualty. The wet training is an important drill. Out at sea, an enemy torpedo attack or even a burst pipe can cause a flood. The first crew members on the scene must block the water with their bodies. Then a repair crew arrives and hammers wood wedges into the pipe to plug the leak. The wedges are sawed off, leaving just enough wood in the hole to stop the water. A rubber patch and some twine finish the job. It's an exhausting and very real simulation. 
but one that will help this ship survive a disaster at sea. Combat aircraft, weaponry, and safety drills are just part of this supercarrier's arsenal of war. Next, we'll look at the USS Ronald Reagan's first line of defense, a powerful phalanx of ships that protect and defend her from attack. To the enemy, it's a big floating target in the middle of the ocean. That's why carrier defense is a top priority for Captain Terry Kraft. We've got a lot of, uh, a lot of ways to help defend this ship uh, against an enemy attack. Layered defense is the key. Good intelligence of, uh, of what's out there is going to be the key to defending this ship should we have to. The Reagan's layered defense depends on the carrier strike group, a group of up to eight smaller ships that work together to surround and shield the Reagan from enemy attack. An aircraft carrier strike group is a lot like a symphony orchestra. There are many pieces of that orchestra that operate independently, and yet they have to blend together. Some of the most powerful ships in the U.S. Navy come along when the Reagan ventures out on deployment. One or more Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyers. They're highly maneuverable strike ships that guard the carrier from attack. The group also includes a Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruiser. Its crew closely monitors their radars looking for threats. Her firepower includes 5-inch guns and radar-guided Tomahawk missiles. These regular weapons tests assure Captain Sean O'Connor the cruiser is ready to do its job. Quite frankly, the U.S. Navy built this ship to defend the aircraft carrier. That's why we have it. That's why it's here. That's why I am always within eyesight 10 miles or so away from that carrier. And my primary mission in life is to make sure she is properly defended. Finally, prowling nearby, there's always at least one highly classified Los Angeles-class submarine. Its mission, seek out and destroy hostile enemy ships and subs. The strike group's ships form a powerful shield around the Reagan, but the carrier's first line of defense, its outermost circle, is the air wing. Flying out to a 250-mile radius, the F-18s protect the carrier against air and surface threats. Nearby, the prowler identifies and jams enemy radar signals so they can't find the rig. While the Hawkeye acts like an early warning system, its radar sweeps around the strike group, picking up distant threats from as far as 250 miles away. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, bring it south very slowly. Inside the Hawkeye, the three-person surveillance crew processes threat identification picked up from the radars and relays it to the F-18s and the strike group ships. Two zero one and two ten. Got it. We're really kind of like a node for the air wing and the strike group, and a lot of information goes through us and comes out of us in order to for everybody to execute their mission more effectively. There's one more layer to the Reagan's defense, the Combat Direction Center, or CDC, an operation center on board the Reagan itself. Here, in a room next to the carrier's island, tactical action officer Tom Jacobson monitors radar and keeps in close contact with the Hawkeye and the rest of the strike group, looking for potential threats. We, uh track all of the surface and subsurface and air tracks all around us using all of our radars and we're pretty much the uh, yard dog for the Ronald Reagan make sure nobody gets in their yard to defend the ship the tactical action officer can call on the F-18 strike fighters anything that gets past the planes will have to face the Reagan's radar guided ordnance like the Sea Sparrow missile 
fired from one of two launchers on either side of the flight deck. These 12-foot-long weapons can fly more than 2,500 miles per hour to intercept enemy missiles or aircraft. Well, the radars will track a guy all the way in, and we'll determine if he's uh, hostile. And if so, at a certain point, we'll make the determination that we need to use the missiles to uh, unhostile him real quick. And uh, our mission is to make sure that the Ronald Reagan doesn't take the first hit. Fire! Fire! American military leaders send the ship out on deployment at sea for months at a time. But when deployment ends, the crew has to prepare the ship for its time off. That's when they conduct one of their most complicated operations. Yeah, these are all Conrep, right? Yes, sir. Offloading most of the ship's 10 million pounds of explosive ordnance. When we get ready to put the ship into a maintenance period, which is coming up for us, uh, we'll take a lot of the ammunition off in order to free up some of the spaces to do the work that we need to do. Uh, and then uh, once we deploy again, we'll load that ammunition back on. The first task, clear the hangar bay to make room for huge stacks of ammunition. To do this, the crew moves every plane to the front end of the flight deck and parks them only inches apart. The plane's combined weight causes the ship to lean to one side. So the ship's engineers balance the supercarrier by pumping water and jet fuel to the other side. The carrier's crew begins the operation by shooting four pairs of lines across the 160-foot gap. We shoot shot lines, which are just very small, thin lines of uh, a nylon cord. And then we pull those cords over with bigger line and then bigger line. And finally, we pull over the big heavy wire. When the Reagan's weapons are ready, a Navy ammunition ship comes alongside. And stacks of ordnance make the 160-foot journey across. To make the transfer, both the carrier and the supply ship must maintain a constant speed and an exact distance of 160 feet apart for three to six hours. If the ships stray off course, the wires could stretch and snap, recoiling like a deadly whip. The longer you do it, the more chances of a safety mishap happening. So we want to do it as safe and as smooth as possible. Helicopters also help out. By burying bombs through the air. The uh, ordnance we're moving is, is heavy. Uh, some of the loads up in excess of 3,500 pounds, and uh, takes a lot of skill. And, and uh, moving the aircraft, a lot of uh, hands-on work, it wears you out pretty quickly. After three days, the ammo offload is complete. When the ammo is gone and the last aircraft mission has been flown, the USS Ronald Reagan heads for home. These sailors have been at sea for more than three months, and they're ready for the deployment to end. How's your family doing? Good, sir. Good? Good. The boys are getting big. How old are they? They'll be three in August, sir. Yeah. We have been underway a lot. The hard part about that, uh, that you just can't get around, it's hard on the families. So we're, we're looking forward to getting home. The ship sails back toward its home port 
in San Diego, California. But first, it makes an important stop at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. To honor American sailors lost here during World War II, the Reagan's crew mans the rails for close to two hours, including a 15-minute salute to the USS Arizona Memorial. Five days after the stop in Hawaii, the USS Ronald Reagan sails into its home port in San Diego. On shore, families wait patiently for the crew to return with flags and homemade signs. The long months apart make the homecoming an emotional experience. According to Navy tradition, sailors who've become new fathers during deployment are the first on shore. It's a powerful experience as they meet their newborn children for the first time. They've called this ship home for months. Now they disembark returning to their family's embrace. This supercarrier's mission is complete. But it won't be long before the USS Ronald Reagan, the world's largest mobile combat airport, is back out at sea. And when it's prowling the oceans, adversaries will have to take notice of this ultimate weapon. For years to come, this supercarrier will send a message to the world, the same message delivered by the president whose name it carries. Peace through strength. <laughs> 